sometimes, like the choir piece or the solo, you just kind of find yourself holding your breath and then you let out at the end and you ponder what the Spirit has said in the midst of that moment. In 2004, Josh Groban sang the song you heard as a solo at halftime at the Super Bowl. He dedicated it to the people of the space shuttle Columbia, and it was a song that was composed by an Irish-Norwegian duo known as Secret Garden. They mainly performed instrumental music, and this song actually was written as an instrumental piece to start with. It was composed by Rolf Loveland, and words were added later by Brendan Graham. But he said when he wrote the words, he wrote them all in one night and never had to do any revisions whatsoever, no rewrites at all. It flowed, it came to him, and he wrote it out that way without having to do any kind of revision. It contains portions of what we know as Danny Boy. You all have heard it's a popular piece through the years. But this piece almost died after it was uh, written because nobody was really that interested in it. It was only when Groban took it and gave it context that, and gave it his own touch that it really became a popular piece. When you think about it, the music that we hear has to have context in some way or another. The stories that we read have to have context. The scriptures that we read have to have context, and that's when it takes own life. Groban was reared in the Episcopal Church, and it reflects some of his faith in there too, and that added a dimension to it as well. Not as a secular piece, but as something that speaks beyond that to all of us. The words that are contained in that, I'll remind you again. When I am down, and oh, my soul so weary, when troubles come and my heart burdened be, then I am still and wait here in the silence until you come and sit a while with me. You raise me up so I can stand on mountains. You raise me up. To walk on stormy seas. I am strong when I am on your shoulders. You raise me up to more than I can be. Anytime I read the story of Zacchaeus, that song comes to mind. Because Zacchaeus is one of my favorite characters, probably because I learned it as a child, and Zacchaeus has been my friend since I could barely speak. I grew up with Zacchaeus, though I got taller than he was. And the thing is, as, as I think about it, there's so many elements of that piece that weave into the story of Jesus, the story of Zacchaeus, the story of our own lives. Luke 19, beginning with verse 1, is our text. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but being a short man, he could not because of the crowd. So he ran ahead and he climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him. Since Jesus was coming that way, when Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and he said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. Now, y'all learned it a different way in a song. You learn, Zacchaeus, you come down, for I'm coming to your house today. But it's the same spirit of that. All the people saw this, and they began to mutter, he's gone to be the guest of a sinner, a common uh, criticism there. But Zacchaeus stood up, and he said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I've cheated anybody out of anything... I'll pay back four times the amount. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and save that which was lost. Jesus states his missional purpose. 
He came to seek and save those who were lost, regardless of who they were, regardless of anything else within their lives. I vividly remember when I was a child going to the Christmas parade, uh, Lynn, you'll remember, the Christmas parades in Macon, Georgia. Macon could do a parade really well. And the streets would fill with people, Cherry Street right through there, and they would have, the TV cameras would be there, and the parade was filled with floats, and people just throng the sidewalks. And the idea was that after they finished that, then they'd go directly into the stores that all had Christmas sales, and they would buy their Christmas gifts. And that was a tradition, because my dad loved parades and fairs and things like that. And so as a little bitty boy, I can still remember going with my parents to those parades. I also remember standing there with Dad and Mom, and as we were standing, Jerry, and as we were standing there, all the people were in front of us, all the people were around, and they gathered more and more, and people would try to get to the front. So pretty soon, I was looking at back pockets and knees and belt buckles and things like this. That's what I was seeing at my level, and I would strain and try to look, and I'd been taught better than to go burrow my way through and push people aside, so I didn't do that. I just kind of stood there and kept trying hard to see, and I'd stand on my tiptoes and try to see what was going by, and then all of a sudden, I'd feel my dad's strong hands up under my arms, and he would just lift me up and place me on his shoulders. I became the tallest person there because my dad put me at a level that I could see anything and everything. I could see the floats. I could see the people. Other people looked up to me because I was on my dad's shoulders. I didn't like heights either, and I still don't. And so when I would get up there, the first thing I would do is I would grab dad's hair on each side. You had to know my dad was finicky about his hair, and he always carried a comb in his pocket, and he would constantly comb it back in place if the wind hit it or whatever else. And I can still remember feeling his hair and smelling the vitalis that was on his hair (laughs) and watching the parade as it went by. I changed my whole feeling from standing there and looking at belt buckles to being above the crowd because I was strong when I was on his shoulders because he raised me up. Zacchaeus was a Jewish man whose profession was that of tax collector, not a favorite in that day or in ours, I guess, and he was wildly successful, wildly powerful, and he'd lost pretty much every relationship that he had in life because he worked for the hated Roman government, and the Jewish law allowed him to be abused, persecuted, whatever, because he was a tax collector. You could talk about them all you wanted to. And literally, Zacchaeus had gained the whole world, but had lost his soul. He'd gained the whole world, but lost everything that really mattered, lost the relationships and all of this. He could write you a huge check, but he couldn't get a group of people to come to a party. He was lonely, he was hurting, he was separated, he was empty and most likely wondered if anyone cared about him. He even felt empty in his relationship with God, evidently. And the very need of his life was for support and even the religious establishment failed him because they had permission to go against him. I call this the Zacchaeus effect. That's where you gain the world and you lose everything else. You gain what appears to be important, but you lose the things that really are, the spiritual things, the relational things, the things that God wants to give us because you grasp so much the things that you want or I want in my life. Zacchaeus has evidently heard about the teacher Jesus, and he was one, as he understood it, who healed and accepted and taught and blessed probably, Why else would he have wanted to see him? He had curiosity about it, and he needed to be able to see him. So Zacchaeus realized that since he was a short man and there would be a throng of people around Jesus, that he had to work out some way to be able to get to where he could see him. That was one reason. The other reason was 
He knew if he was in a crowd, he would be the one that would become the object of their attention, and he would be abused. And he might even become, a if Jesus wasn't the person he thought he was, he might even become an illustration in Jesus' sermon, saying, well, don't let your life be like this man over here. And so he didn't want to be singled out. So he goes ahead of where the crowd would be coming, and he goes and he climbs a sycamore tree. And he crawls up into it, taking things into his own hands, because he had to raise himself up in that. And he was looking through the foliage and watching as Jesus and the throng came along. I think he realized something was missing and he was trying to figure out if maybe that person really could be genuine and really could offer him something that he had never had before. And all of his power, all of his importance, all of the things that he could wield, his money, none of it mattered. Zacchaeus' curiosity helped him want to escape the people and to see Jesus. Well, he climbed up in hopeful anonymity because he certainly didn't want to be pointed out at any point. But, of course, his luck was it was a hot day, and as Jesus and the throng were coming along, they needed a shady place to stop and, and talk for a minute. So guess where they were? under a sycamore tree. So here you've got Zacchaeus in the tree looking through the foliage. You've got Jesus standing here with all of these people facing Jesus. And I don't have any idea what Zacchaeus said when he realized what was happening. But I promise you it was not a complimentary moment in his life because he felt trapped. None of us like to be pointed out. None of us like to be singled out in some way. You know, like you go to Walmart, and while you're in Walmart, they announce over the paging system, paging Joe Smith, will Joe Smith come to the counter? Your wife cannot find you, and she's ready to go home. (laughs) Can you imagine how mortifying that would be? Or you're in a nice restaurant or in some other gathering, and they announce over the speaker that, will the owner of a blue Mercedes, license number, whatever, please go to your car. You left your car running. Well, that's kind of dual, you know, if on the one hand, to be able to have a blue Mercedes would be pretty cool, but on the other hand, you'd be embarrassed to be the one that had to get up and walk out across in front of everybody. I always think about a time with my middle brother uh, when he was very, very little, and he loved to dress up as a cowboy, and he had his cowboy hat on, his little guns on, and his whole outfit, and, and it was at one of those Christmas parades in Macon, and we went into one of the stores, um, I think it was Joseph Neal right downtown. It was kind of like Curvin's was here. And went into the store, and the throng of people around, people everywhere. And he looked, my grandmother was there, and he looked at her, and he said, Grandmother. And she said, Yes. And he said, Shoot me, because he was a cowboy. And she said, No, no, no. Too many people around and all that. He said, No, shoot me. And so she went bang, and he just fell sprawled out on the floor. (laughs) All the crowd coming around looking, What happened to him? And all grandmother could say was, I I shot him, you know, (laughs) which made matters worse at that particular point. But the singling out of all of that was more than people could take. And Zacchaeus was sure that in any moment he was going to be the one singled out. And sure enough, Jesus looked up in the tree and he spied Zacchaeus there and he called him by name, Zacchaeus. Can you imagine the little man pulling back into the, in the foliage, not wanting to be addressed? Zacchaeus! And he began to look around. Jesus said, come, come down. I'm coming to your house today. I need to come to your house today. I want to be with you. I want some time with you. And Zacchaeus comes down out of the tree, and it says he received Jesus joyfully. He was glad to receive Jesus. That was interesting because that tells you that even in the fear of the moment, even in the frustration of that and the embarrassment that he had to have felt, that he still was excited when somebody called him by name and wanted to spend some time with him. 
change had to take place in his life. And it wasn't going to be something that would happen overnight. There was a lot to sort out, but it was going to happen. And so he and Jesus are together. They spend time together. And Zacchaeus looks at him and he says, something's happening here. If I've wronged anybody, I will give back four times whatever I've taken. He said, I'm even going to take half of what I have and give it to the poor. I want to do something. I want my life to matter. I want it to be about giving rather than taking. I want it to be about experiencing things and doing something for someone else. I realize that what I have is not as important as what I can do. I want to be a person who makes a difference within this world. I don't think that's overreading that moment. In a figurative way, Jesus reached up in the tree that Zacchaeus had to climb up, and he lifts him like strong arms under the arms of him, puts him on his shoulder, lifts him up, and Zacchaeus went from being the shortest person, the most hated person there, to the person that everybody looked at and said, Jesus is going home with him. And the criticism turned to Jesus. Why would he go home with somebody like that? But the point is, Jesus never flinched. Once Jesus got him down, he raised him up, and Zacchaeus' life began to change. No quiet faith for him, no simple, I'll get my life together. He boldly approached it, and he said, if I'm going to have a change, it is going to be a significant change, and I'm going to make an investment in that. It was definitive. You know, we human beings tend to want to control the way life is going. Surrender is something that's very difficult for us, whether it's to Christ or to help or to anything else. Surrender is difficult, especially if we couch it as surrender. For Zacchaeus to give up what was there and to even lower himself a bit, to listen to somebody else was a big, big deal. As humans, we look for trees where we may perch and look at what we think will help while avoiding contact at all costs. We think the trees will save us from that which is chasing us. You know, we're all chased by things. We're chased by grief or failure or secret problems and issues or ambition or temptations or guilt or fear or disappointment or frustration or hopelessness. We're chased by those. You know, all of us face some of that at some point within our lives. And as long as we perch through a tree, looking through the foliage, and trying to figure it out on our own, we will never find the healing that we need. We can see that help is possible. But so many times we say, well, when it gets bad enough, then Zacchaeus didn't have that option. It wasn't when it gets bad enough. It's that Jesus offered it. It was time to accept what Jesus offered. And Jesus said, you come down. I'm going with you to your house. And the only thing Zacchaeus had to do was to accept what was there. To accept it. You know, I've heard stories of cats that got caught up in trees for days and days. I think we had one in Conyers that one of the neighbors had get caught in the tree. They couldn't get the cat down. And the cat meowed, and people would go by, and they'd try, and they couldn't get the cat down. They'd try to put a ladder up, and the cat would fight them. So they just left the cat. And finally, the cat had been up there long enough. He was hungry and was tired, and they got the cat down, and he looked awful. He was thin, and he was worn, but he was rescued. The climb up the tree had deprived him of what he needed, and his stubbornness had almost killed him. When we climb the trees of our own self-sufficiency and try to cower down there, we're not willing to allow anyone, including God, to help us, then we're putting ourselves in self-imposed isolation and we're spiritually starving to death. The scripture says don't neglect the assembling together of yourselves, meaning our coming together, our being together, our studying together, our praying together, our working together together, our working missions together, our caring about each other, our communicating with each other, that's part of what it is. And if we stay isolated away, thinking we can handle things on our own, 
we will starve spiritually. So if we're struggling with problems in our lives, we're not being brave not to ask for help. We're braver when we do. If we doubt and are fearful that help can be there, we're not doing ourselves any favors at all by closing out the very people who want to help us. And if we're struggling, we're not doing a wise thing to separate ourselves. We're just satisfying curiosity like Zacchaeus was. But Zacchaeus had an encounter with the Lord, and the Lord introduced him to a new way. Go back to the cat. Sometimes it gets in the tree, and, it, and you leave food on the ground, and it comes down. But sometimes you leave it there so long another animal gets it. So somebody's got to be there to meet it when it comes down. Jesus said to Zacchaeus, I am here for you. With whatever is going on in your life, I am here for you. I don't care what anybody else says. I don't care what anybody else thinks. I don't care about the criticism. And John even reflects this in the Revelation in chapter 3, verse 20, where God orders the angel of the church of Laodicea to be given the message from the Lord Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I'll come in and eat with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne just as I overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He says Jesus is knocking at the door. Jesus is standing at the the trunk of the tree, calling us down, asking us to re-enter the relationship with him or to revitalize it or to revive that relationship. Why is it so hard for us to receive that? Why do we withdraw from God when we need him the most? When you and I are hurting, why is it that we pull back rather than draw closer to the God of our salvation, because it is at His table we'll be spiritually nurtured. It's being away from Him where we will starve spiritually. That doesn't happen through self-help books. It doesn't happen through a quick lecture on 13 ways to a happy life. It happens through engagement and relationship and Bible and prayer and worship and engagement with God and with one another. It's why we are a family. There was an inspirational writer. His name was Arthur Gordon. He died in 2002 in Savannah, Georgia. And I'd always known him just as a spiritual writer that I had read a couple of things from. But I dug a little deeper into his life, and it was kind of interesting to see. First off, I had no idea his Savannah connection. Secondly, I had no idea that he lived until 2002, and he died in his 80s, like 89 or 87, something like that. But he authored 14 books. But in his career, he was editor of Good Housekeeping magazine, Cosmopolitan, yep, and Guidepost. Could there be any three more diverse magazines than those? And he was editor of all three. Now, Cosmopolitan, he was editor in the 40s. So that was a long time ago before it did a lot of stuff it did. But he was one of those. And out of those experiences, he wrote books. And one of them is called A Touch of Wonder. And in it, he tells a transparent story of his own life. His life was kind of winding down. He felt totally worn out. He felt it was a bleak period in his life when he felt that everything was was flat. Everything was kind of dissipating there. His enthusiasm was gone. He had writer's block. His energy was waning. He felt tired and listless and bored most of the time. There was no joy, no zest in his life. Now this is a guy who had spent his time encouraging other people spiritually and he was in essence burned out completely. He was smart enough to realize he was in trouble so he went and sat down with his doctor. And he asked his doctor, he said, what is it that I need to do? What is it that will help me here? Is there something wrong with me? Am I sick? Is there something happening here? And the doctor said, he said, I don't know what's wrong with me. I just seem to have come to a dead end. He said, I'm not happy. I'm just going through the motions. I'm not creative or productive like I used to be. The radiance and excitement are gone. Can you help me? 
And the doctor said, I don't know, but when were you, where, when were your happiest moments as a child? Where did you go? What did you do when you were happiest as a child? And he said, that's easy. We would go to the beach. There was a cottage there, and we loved to go there. We loved the water. We loved the ocean. It was such a relaxing, beautiful time in our lives. And the doctor asked him, said, okay. Said, if I agree to try to help you, are you willing to follow some instructions? And Gordon said, well, I think so. And he said, all right, here's what I want you to do. I want you to drive to the beach tomorrow morning, no later than 9 o'clock. I want you to take a lunch with you, but I don't want you to read or write, listen to the radio, or talk to anyone. Close everything else out. And here are four prescriptions. I don't want you to open, open one, and then another, and then another, as I tell you. I want you to take one every three hours, one at nine, one at 12, one at three, and one at six. So these are your prescriptions. This is what you're supposed to do. And Arthur Gordon asked the doctor, he said, are you serious to do this? And the doctor, he said, is this a prescription? And he said, yes, it is. He said, are you serious? He said, you'll know how serious I am when you get my bill. But he said, this is, this is what I'm doing, and it is a prescription, and I expect you to do it. So the next morning, he got up, and at 9 o'clock, he went to the beach. And he opened the first one, and the first prescription said this. It said, listen carefully. And he said, well, listen to what? What am I supposed to be listening to? And he fought it for a little bit. I can't talk to anybody. I can't do anything. What am I listening for? But then he began to listen, and he heard nature. He heard the ocean. He heard the seagulls. He heard sounds about him. And he said it was amazing how fast that the sounds of creation ate up the three hours. And he felt himself relaxing. Well, he thought to himself, yes, I'm a part of this. And he reflected on what he heard, and the three hours were gone. It was noon, and he opened the next one. And it said, try reaching back. So he started thinking about the past. He thought of thinking about his life and things that had happened. And, and it went back to his past, his childhood, the happy times, the good times, the things he was thankful for. So many things in life that were rich and valuable. And again, the time just flew by on him. And it was now 3 o'clock. And he opened the next prescription and it said, re-examine your motives. And that made him furious. He said, who is this guy to tell me to re-examine my motives? I've done good things. I've helped people. I've done spiritual writing. And then he began to realize, well, you know, maybe I got more into my writing for what I made off of it. Maybe it became more of a job than a ministry, maybe this and that. And three hours were gone. The sun was starting to set, and it was now six o'clock. And he opened the fourth and final prescription, and he found these words. Write your worries in the sand. And so he thought about it, so he started scribbling some things that were worrying him in the sand. And it was just at the time the tide was coming in. And he couldn't get them written fast enough before the ocean washed them away. And he said, I get the message. He said at that point he was reborn emotionally and spiritually. He was raised up. And it was more than he could have been by himself. He was confronted by his own needs. He had to listen, go back to his roots, re-examine his motives and write his worries in the sand and allow Jesus to wash over them. Same thing happened with Zacchaeus. He came down. He went with Jesus. Jesus raised him up to more than he could be. Why wouldn't we let God do that for us? Why is it we keep fighting against him, trying to do things ourselves? Why is it that we can't find peace in just being with Christ? Amen. Spirit of God, as you speak to us in these moments, convict us of the things that need to happen in our own lives. Maybe we need that kind of break in our routines. Maybe we need to rethink things 
in exactly that same way. Maybe we need to find you in the sufficiency of your grace and love in our lives. Maybe we need to grow closer to you. Maybe we need to accept you as Savior. Maybe we need to become a part of this church. Maybe we need to rededicate our lives. Whatever you're calling us to do, may we be willing to come out of the tree and be raised to your shoulders. We'll see things from a totally different perspective. And we may even be renewed in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.